Digital marketing seems to be the mystery that most entrepreneurs struggle with, and real estate investors are no exception. The truth is, there are multiple avenues to success. Those experiences will be best shared by the guests on this podcast. My name is Jason Wright, and I would like to welcome you to Real Estate Investor Marketing Stories. What's going on, Jason Wright here? Welcome to the first guest episode of this podcast. Exciting stuff. We are finally here. Man, this is uh, this is something that I have missed for a long time. Really looking forward to it. Well, I'm just going to give you a preview of the next couple of episodes, this one included, but there is some great value here, as you would expect, but there are some wonderful opportunities to laugh hard, right? Life's too short to be miserable, so there's a lot of a lot of good laughs here. You'll have to check it out. But before I tell you who I'm talking to today, well, you probably know by the title, but before I get into that, I just got back from Race Fest uh, down in Louisville, Kentucky, uh, just last week. And Hunter Thompson and his team put that on, and it's their first big event they've done. And let me tell you, not because Hunter's a friend of mine and a client, a good dude, but what a fantastic event. Like, it is what it is, right? And uh, just talking to a lot of other people that were there, it's not just my opinion. It's pretty pretty widespread feedback. So what a cool event. For me, selfishly, it's kind of nice because it's only two hours, uh, two hours of a drive for me, like not not far at all. Everything else uh, that we do is, is far away. So next event I'm going to is best ever in Salt Lake City. Not super easy to get to from Indianapolis. There's a layover, and it's you know it's a pretty expensive flight, but there's nothing you can do, right? You're at the mercy of the the air, airline travel corridors, so to speak. But uh, Race Fest was uh, something that my team and I had been gearing up for for uh, six weeks, eight weeks, and what I mean by that is. Obviously, I'm in digital marketing, so active capital raisers, real estate entrepreneurs uh, are kind of our ideal client, right, for this business. So we've been getting ready for it for a long time and just really didn't know what to expect. I uh, just had previous events to kind of go by. And um, yeah, it's been, pre- it's been pretty wild. Um, so we'll we'll see how things play out over the next couple of weeks. But I think it's going to be a great use of our time. Uh, I had a great opportunity speaking there. I had a great time getting that feedback, and it was just a really nice experience. So just a great community of people. All right, enough about me and my random thoughts. In this episode, we are going to talk to David Robinson of Canova Capital. Real cool dude, by the way. Real successful guy. And he is also the host of the Lead Sponsor Podcast. So I will let you, David, tell you more about him as you listen to our conversation. So let's get into it. What's happening, David? Welcome to the show, man. Jason, thanks for having me on. Excited to be here and looking forward to the conversation. Awesome, awesome. So uh, I'd love to hear kind of how you got started on this road to real estate investing, man. Tell me what that story is like. I think we got to back up um, to my first real job. I guess we can call it a real job. (laughs) <laughs> uh, I graduated from high school, was in, um, was, uh, going to college, uh, state college in Arizona. And, um, my dad is a mechanical engineer at a small, uh, engineering firm. And I, uh, I was hired by my dad, um, to, and I was doing mainly just administrative stuff. Um, no real technical engineering stuff, but, uh, mainly administrative duties. And I kept screwing up this one particular task, which is a, an incredibly simple task. I just think I was being lazy and I messed it up multiple times. And he finally came over and he's like, we can't do this. This isn't going to work. And he fired me on the spot. And he said, you got to go find your own way. This isn't going to happen. So that was the moment I realized I was going to be taking more of an entrepreneurial journey. Um, I decided to, you know, dive headlong into real estate. I've been a real estate broker for, oh, 18 years now. It's pretty much all I know professionally. Uh, I've spent a lot of time in the traditional residential space. So early on, my business was focused on foreclosure prevention and short sales. And so, uh, you know, to talk about the marketing aspect of that, I, I, I built up a, uh, 
uh, a significant website that was f focused on search engine optimization as we were leading up into 2007, 2008. And so uh, if anyone were to search online for a foreclosure prevention specialist or a short sale specialist in Utah, I, w I ranked very high for a significant number of key phrases. And so that took my business to another level, ran one of the largest uh, short sale businesses and foreclosure prevention businesses in Utah. And then uh, eventually that market shifted and I had to go uh, really completely bare bones back down to the bottom of my business and revamp it to, uh, to serve clients just in the traditional residential space. And during that time, I've built small sales teams. I've managed a national franchise brokerage, and I focused mainly on the operational and marketing side of the business. And I hired real estate agents to help uh, with the actual sales process. Then um, about a decade into that business, I realized, my goodness, I hadn't done nearly enough on the investing side of the business to really accomplish what I intended on accomplishing getting into real estate. It's crazy how many real estate agents and brokers are in the space, but they fail to actually do the investing side. Um, and that was me. And so I had to take a real hard look at my business, how it was structured, what I was focused on. I pivoted strictly into investment sales. And then by pivoting into investment sales, I, I started working with a lot of investors, obviously. Yep. I realized a lot of the investors that I was working with didn't have a desire to actually own the real estate. They wanted all the benefits of owning real estate, but they didn't want all the headaches, hassles, and challenges. And that led me down the path of figuring out a, a more efficient way for my investors to participate, which led me into real estate syndications and private equity. And today um, I have two businesses. I still have the brokerage business here in Utah, which focuses on helping clients acquire top performing, small scale multifamily property in Utah, anything $5 million and below. And then I also have the private equity business, which focuses on acquiring large commercial multifamily uh, and then structuring those as syndications to allow our investor network to participate alongside us in those deals. Beautiful. So many cool things in there I want to pick out. One, are you a dad on good terms now? Is he is he proud of his <laughs> now? <laughs> of course, way better terms than we would have been had I kept working with him. So yeah, absolutely. That's awesome, man. And I, I love, uh, and congrats on your success. And I love the the rising up and the falling and the rising again. You know, that's true entrepreneurship. And it just seems like whether it's this industry or in general, there's still too many people that think it's going to be a, a three-month ride from zero to hero and it's all roses and unicorns. But the reality is it's uh, it's quite brutal and ugly at times and uh, can make you really reach some really low lows in your mind. So um, very cool stuff, man. I love it. So right now, um, what, so you said commercial uh, multifamily, is that the main asset class that you focus on? Is So the question is kind of like, what asset classes and markets do you focus on uh, and why? Yeah, um, multifamily is the only asset class that we have participated in this uh, up to this point. That being said, um, very interested in uh, adjacent classes, mobile home parks, and self storage. Yep. Uh, they lean, you know, they they function very similar to multifamily, and so yep. um, those are two other classes that we're interested in, and and we'll probably participate in 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 the short term. Um, but multifamily is. Uh, what we focus on. And as far as geographic focus, um, we're really agnostic. Um, my business model is such that my goal is to provide a variety of investment opportunities to my investor network. Most of my investor network is based in Utah, about 80%, 20% are based outside of Utah. And my investors work through me because they want to diversify outside of what they're doing here in Utah. Utah is a high growth market. So there's a lot of reasons to be investing in Utah, but cash flow hasn't necessarily been one of those in years past. And so my goal is to provide them a variety of opportunities, variety in the form of geographic focus, uh, operational focus, meaning who are we partnering with? Who's the boots on the ground in the local market that we're investing in? Asset class, as well as business plan. What type of business plan and hold term is this? Is it a long-term hold? Is it a short-term deal? And is it a deep value add or is it more of a cash flow play? 
And so uh, to answer your question, I'm really agnostic as it relates to the geographic focus. In fact, I want to have a variety. Uh, we're in multiple markets at this point, Kansas City, Northeast Cleveland, uh, uh, Texas, Houston, Texas, Georgia, uh, Utah. So um, yeah, I want to have a variety of investment opportunities for my investment network. That's awesome. And that's uh, it's not typically what I hear. I talk to a ton of cool people like you all the time. And usually people are like really dialed in, you know what I mean? To like in a part of the country or maybe even like one city or one metro area. So your strategy is awesome and it makes a hell of a lot of sense to me. So I like the key, it. The key there, Jason, is, and yes, if you are the lead sponsor operating your own deals um, or taking the, the vast majority of the operational uh, duties, then I think proximity to the deal is critical. In my role, uh, I play less of uh, a role in the day-to-day -day operations. Yep. Um, and so for me, it's more about who is that guy? Who is that person that's entrenched in their local market that has local expertise and local relationships that can give me and my investors a competitive advantage? I like it. So this will be interesting. Uh, switching gears a little bit here, uh, if you think back over your journey to this point, what simple marketing strategies, strategies and tactics have really let you get traction with uh, attracting new investors to your business? So what was that first thing that you started to find success with the people as people started to come your way? Um, I think we can take it from two different perspectives. One is the just uh, the investing side, the brokerage business side, which is more like uh, grassroots ground. Like if, if you have listeners that are trying to do their own investing, that's one avenue. Then we can also take it from the private equity side and that focus, which would be b most beneficial to you. Uh, I'll let you roll with it any way you want to, my friend. Okay. Well, from, from the brokerage side and actually finding opportunities, here's the deal. Um, we, we try, uh, our goal is to source uh, small scale multifamily property for our private investors. These are individuals that are wanting to buy investment property for their own personal portfolio. So anything under $5 million, okay? Even all the way down to like your typical duplex and fourplex. Yep. So um, in that goal, uh, you know, everybody wants this magic bullet of finding the best deals and the best opportunities. I will say it seems that the best opportunities are found off market, right? The reality is that as a broker, that's always my job is to find off market deals, right? Um, if it's already listed, it's not as beneficial to me. So I want to I want to be in contact with the owners. And there's really three proven methods to finding off market deals. Um, the first is direct mail. Yeah. Everybody wants to poo poo direct mail, but the reality is direct mail works. Um, it's just a long-term play and it takes consistency over time to a targeted list. So direct mail, uh, cold calling direct to owner. Okay. Uh, so we've done a heavy amount of cold calling or what I would call uh, targeted calling, yep. um, for property owners that match our criteria. And I have a, we have a process for making those calls. And then the lastly is actually marketing buyers. So what we do is we take our listing and our inventory, we market those properties, we attract attention through those properties. And the reality is that many of those would-be buyers are also sellers of real estate. So those are our top three ways to find off-market deals uh, in, in our market today from the private investor perspective. Yeah, it's beautiful. And uh, I've heard this theme, um, even when I did my last podcast, I started to hear this, but direct mail is like, is coming back, is still effective. It always was effective. I think it's probably less competitive than it was 10 years ago, which is great for people like you. But the thing I want to drive home to the listeners, what he's talking about is effort and consistency. Crazy idea, right? <laughs> Some people just think uh, you just you put up a website and you sit back and things happen, but you're going after it, right? You're going after it and you have to, to get results. So I think it's a beautiful thing. And I would, I would add to that, probably the magic to it all is having a robust follow-up process. Yep. And, you know, this is your world inside of active campaign and, and executing a CRM strategy that helps automate a lot of that. Yep. But that's probably the most critical piece because the reality is 
the vast majority of the potential leads that we generate uh, aren't going to transact business within the first two weeks or 30 days or even 90 days. Yep. We have to nurture those relationships along and that requires uh, a systematized process for following up with those people, having a robust CRM and uh, and a strategy for staying top of mind with those people. Yeah, so the question I ask people a lot is, uh, you know, if you if you have a conversation, if you have a call with somebody and they don't buy whatever you're selling, whatever you're doing, the first time, what do you do next? Most people say nothing. And it's like, what? When we built a pipeline in our business, it doubled year over year. It just, it changed everything. And there's nothing more um, reassuring to me than when we close a deal that we first talked to a year ago. They've been in yeah. there for, they've been getting all the things that we do. And it's like, that's powerful. So as they say, the fortunes in the follow-up and you're, you're spot on there. Uh, what has been your biggest mistake that you've made in regards to marketing so far? What's the thing you did and you're like, what am I doing? This is a waste of time and money or whatever, you know? My biggest mistake when it comes, okay, yeah, I've got a good one. Um, There's a time and a place in your business for branded marketing. Mm -hmm. So early on in my brokerage business, um, we... Uh, I was contacted by a firm that specialized in brand marketing. Well, from where I was in my business at that point in time, brand marketing was a massive mistake. Yep. I, because it, it, it takes so long to build a build brand recognition yep. and it's generally focused on minimal calls to action it's really just focused on awareness yep. and then driving traffic that way what i realized is that i needed direct response so i ended up hiring this firm paying them roughly twenty five thousand dollars to implement a campaign for me that ultimately fell flat on its face and it was a combination of digital marketing as well as um direct mail marketing and it fell flat because there wasn't any real teeth or calls to action or value that was being offered. When I shifted my focus to direct response and uh, a bigger focus on copywriting and calls to action, that's when we started to get some traction. So I think unless you're a, a firm, a well-established firm, a well-established uh, investor or a well-established company, I think you need to focus more heavily on direct response marketing versus brand focused marketing. That's really powerful. And I'll tell you what, I was sitting in this office, uh, three years into this business. My wife came in one day, very frustrated, like, where's the money in this business you're building? And I was like, I'm working on it. She's like, you've been saying that, like, what, what are we selling? Who are we targeting? And I was like, oh my God, I don't know. I've been focused on the brand. But even if people, I get their attention and push them somewhere, like, what are they supposed to do then? So that's the moment when I started thinking with the end in mind, start with the back end then the front end and then go find more people. But I was like, I need to know what I'm selling. I need to know who I'm speaking to. And it's a very, uh, it's a very powerful lesson that we both kind of learned that uh, in different ways. So yeah, man, I get it. Um, this will be interesting. Hope you're ready for this, my friend. <laughs> Wait, Let's hear it. Can't wait. Can you sh share a story about your real estate investing journey that you ever that you haven't shared on another podcast or shared publicly? It could be anything you want. Good, bad, ugly, funny, whatever. I've only showed it, uh, I've been on quite a few other podcasts, so I can't think of anything that I haven't shared. But one that I that I uh have only shared one other time because it's quite embarrassing. <laughs> um I, I was I was quite a bit younger. Uh, I was a hungry real estate broker, getting after it, and and my business had really started to take off in the short sale space. And you know, for those of you that are newer into the industry, you may not fully grasp what that world looked like back then. But you had a lot of distress. This is two thousand nine, ten, and eleven. A lot of distress. A lot of very stressed out homeowners, and we were focused on working with homeowners. So uh, investors can be stressed out. But if homeowners are being foreclosed on, it's, you know, a completely heightened level. 
oh, yeah. dealing with a lot of divorce situations and, and bankruptcy situations. So it was brutal, but it was a very good business for us. And we helped a lot of people. Well, the reality is I got very busy in this business and I was taking all the sales calls. And back then we didn't have Zoom. We didn't have some of these things that we can do to leverage our time. And so I was actually, I would have someone come to the website that would fill out a consultation form. I would have a brief over the phone consultation and prep, make sure that I was doing everything I could to prep for the appointment. And I generally wouldn't go on an appointment unless I was 100% sure that I was going to get the business, that I was going to get a listing agreement signed or a purchase agreement signed. And so I, I became accustomed to that where I did a great job of positioning myself as the expert. They were coming to me for solutions. I solved their solution over the phone and vetted them, make sure that they were a right fit for me. And then I'd go out and actually physically meet with them in their home. And that's where we would put the contract together. Yep. Well, in this particular instance, I drove uh, around an hour and 15 minutes to an appointment um, on an evening, which I generally wouldn't have done, but in a, in a late evening time, which wasn't optimal for me, but it was optimal for the, for the potential client. Anyways, I'm uh, getting long on the story, but the reality is I got into that appointment, went through my spiel, expecting it to be, you know, a 15, 20 minute thing. And they didn't like my answers and they didn't, uh, for some reason, we just didn't connect yeah. and they, they, they didn't want to work with me. And I, I, I kept telling them a part of the reason was I told them what they could sell their house for. And it was significantly less than what they thought. Yeah. And it was painful for them. Yeah. And they didn't like what I had to say about that. And they probably didn't like my really straightforward approach. Cause yeah. at this point in my business, I was just super straightforward. Yeah. Well, we went away from that. I, I said, are you kidding me? Like, we're not moving forward. And, you know, it was probably poor salesmanship. I wasn't in the right mindset. It was a bad move by my uh, on my part all the way through. That being said, I left that appointment. I was frustrated. I left that appointment and um, I, was dry, I, was, I was driving the next morning and I was listening to this uh, radio show. This is back when, you know, we listened to the radio <laughs> as we're driving in the car. And the host had asked the question, do you have any real estate horror stories? And that homeowner outed me. They actually didn't out me personally. I like, didn't use my name or anything like that. But they said the exact story on that radio show. And they basically, their perspective was completely different than mine. But yeah. they were not happy with me as a broker. And they, they really, you know... It said how horrible this guy was coming to their house, trying to force them to sign an agreement. And they even said, like, what kind of real estate broker drives a big uh, four by four truck? Um, for some reason, they had this impression in their mind that I should be driving a Lexus or something up to their house. I don't know. But um, anyways, long story short, that, that, that was an embarrassing moment for me. In fact, one of my friends in the industry, uh, I had told him about it. And he heard the same interview and he, and he called me right after and he's like, was this you? And uh, I had to admit that it was, yeah. That's crazy. Did that make you like say, all right, I can't ever do that again. Like I got to change the approach a little bit. Um, I definitely recognized that I had been way too aggressive yeah. um, in my approach with the client. I probably, you know, I was in a rush. I was, you know, wanting to get home with my family. Um, and it, it was just a, one of those moments where you just weren't on your A game yeah. and you know, that had I taken a little bit more of a consultative approach with this couple, then I'm sure I would have, you know, got their business a few days later, but I blew that one. That's for sure. I appreciate you sharing, man. That's great. Uh, all right. What's one piece of marketing advice you'd give another active capital raiser just getting into the game? Okay. So if we, yeah, I think it's good for us to shift maybe to the capital raising side. Um, I would say you've got to find your tribe. Like you've got to find your competitive advantage. Yep. And I'm fairly young in the capital raising space. Uh, you know, I've raised, you know, roughly $5 million nice. in a 12 month period. Yep. Nice. So I would say that's some significant success for someone who's new in the space. Yep. But what gave me a, so if I was trying to attract attention from a broad audience of qualified investors, I would fail because I don't have anything, uh, any type of 
unique competitive advantage to beat out the guys that are significantly more experienced than me. Yep. Where my competitive advantage lies is in the fact that I'm a local broker and I'm building local relationships. Yep. And now um, I had built up a pretty robust network of, of investors that were interested in this type of stuff long before my first raise. Yep. So I had spent 12 months sort of prepping my investor network for what I was about to do. And that led to a very successful entry into the space. So I, I would say I would give two points. Number one, you've got to figure out who your tribe is, who's in your sphere of influence, and really lean into that space. So whatever that is, whether you are a former accountant, whether you're a former attorney, whether you're a, a former marketing guy, wh whatever it is, lean into that space and attract people because they're, you're going to have a leg up in the, in the competitive advantage of having trust. Yep. So that's step number one. And then uh, number two, I think, is having a way bigger list than you think. So I had built up a robust uh, list of investors, and I realized that less than, it was roughly 3% of my investors in that database actually invest. Yep. So I had to have a very, and, and that's my focus now, is how do I take this from a few thousand people to 10,000 people in my investor database? Yep. Right. No, I think it's great advice. I think one of the biggest mistakes uh, that I see from, from my side is, I'll say, who are you, who are you targeting? Anybody who's accredited? Ooh. It's kind of broad. When it earth's kind of broad. So yeah, I, I see the same thing. It's like, hey, if you were a pilot or whatever, speak the language that you already speak, right? Speak to other people like you, maybe that are a few years behind you and that type of thing. It's great advice. So And thanks. and I would I would add to that, Jason, that it, the smaller you go initially, the easier it is to attract attention and build trust. Yep. Then you can expand beyond that in the future. Yep. It'll go really narrow to begin with because now we're starting to attract attention from investors that are outside of sort of my unique avatar yep. and outside of the state of Utah. Yep. So it, it can expand in the future, but if you go really narrow to start, I think you have a, a better chance at, at winning in the short term. Yeah, I agree. I mean, in, in this business with me, when I went broad, it was so much more difficult than when I went super, we're super narrow now, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, it does make a huge difference. Yeah, because you're going to, you know, instantly attract or repel people right away. And that polarity is a good thing. It's a good thing for everybody. So uh, beautiful. All right. What are you most focused on now as you continue to grow your business? What kind of things are you thinking about for, you know, the rest of 2023? So uh, really the it's the database. So my business success will be in direct relation to the size of my database and the quality of the relationships I have inside of that database. Yep. So for me, my one thing for 2023 is literally growing. I have it written up on my whiteboard here that I'm looking at literally growing my database by five times this year. Oh boy. I like it. And so what it's causing me to do is think outside of what I had done in the past yep. to get to where I was and say, all right, if I'm going to grow this by five times in a condensed period of time, how do I go about doing that? And so that's my focus. And then uh, on the backside of that is education and relationships. So the more content that we can produce that's valuable to our investor network and really serving that database at a high level that's going to build trust and it's going to increase the uh, quality of the relationships in that database, which will then funnel down into raising more capital and doing more deals with quality people. I, yeah. That's sort of broad. If we want to go deeper than that, we can, but that's the focus right now. No, yeah, I think it's great. And I just got back from Ray's Fest in Louisville uh, this last week. And one thing I talked to a lot of people about is just like when you're able to like look at somebody face to face, build real relationships, keep it going. It's so powerful. You know, one relationship can change your business, change your life. So you're echoing a lot of the same things and it's, uh, it's, it's really good stuff. And I hope people are listening and paying attention to what we're saying. This is gold. Uh, how can our listeners get more info from you or learn more about something that you're doing right now? Yeah. So if, uh, two ways, uh, if you're looking to invest in Utah real estate for your own personal portfolio, you can reach us at canovogroup.com. That's C-A-N-O-V-O canovogroup.com. 
And if you're a passive investor looking for uh, passive investment opportunities across a diversified list of opportunities, then you can go to canovocapital.com, C-A-N-O-V-O capital.com, canovocapital.com. And then I will make a plug for my uh, podcast. We interview elite real estate syndication sponsors and investment fund managers who have acquired at least $100 million in commercial real estate. And it's a weekly podcast. We in interview some incredible people and that's the lead sponsor podcast. So just search up the lead sponsor and you'll find us there. Awesome, man. Well, I've had a lot of fun, David. I uh, appreciate you coming on. Okay. Thanks, Jason. Appreciate it and look forward to staying in touch. Yep. See you soon. Thank you for listening to this episode of the show. I had a great time making it and I hope you really enjoyed yourself listening to it. If you want to keep up with all things Real Estate Investor Marketing Stories podcast related, I encourage you strongly to go to reimarketingstories.com and signing up for our podcast newsletter. We will simply keep you up to date with what's going on with the show, new episodes, and things like that. reimarketingstories.com So hopefully today's episode and the other episodes that you'll listen to will remind you that as a real estate investor, everybody starts at the beginning, okay? Um, our guest today and the other guests that you will hear on this show will share their real story, right? They'll tell you what worked, what didn't work. And I want you to remember one thing if you remember nothing else today. It's possible for you to, okay? Never stop going and keep following your passion. Finally, today's show has been brought to you by CapitalRaisingAutomations.com. If you're an active capital raiser, and you are ready to learn the three areas that are holding you back from raising more capital, I strongly suggest you check out CapitalRaisingAutomations.com. Check out our free 10-minute video there, and you let me know if it doesn't provide you value. I'm sure it will. All right, thanks again for listening to the show this week. Hope to see you next time.